Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort. One of the exciting ways we're extending the brand of Transit Unplugged is now I'm hosting live CEO roundtables around the world. One of the ones I was able to do recently was at the UITP Global Transport Summit in Stockholm, Sweden. On our first panel, we included Alan Feta, Deputy CEO of Public Transport Victoria, or PTV, the public transit authority in that state in Australia. Also, Nicholas Gent, CEO of Yara Trams in Australia, in Melbourne, which is the largest light rail or tram system in the world. We also included Ian Dobbs, who's Deputy President of UITP and a longtime transit leader, and Nat Ford. CEO of Jacksonville Transportation Authority, and the former chairman of APTA, the American Public Transportation Association. I think you'll find this special nearly hour-long show a real good insight into what's happening around the world when it comes to mobility innovations on this special edition of Transit Unplugged. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Welcome to Trapeze's first ever Transit Unplugged Global CEO Roundtable. I'm Paul Comfort, and thank you for being with us. You can clap. Go ahead. Good to have us here. This is going to be filmed, and we have four of our, uh, our guests today on our Transit Unplugged CEO Roundtable. Our first is Nicholas Gent, who is CEO of Yara Trams and Keolis Downer in Melbourne, down in Australia. I was able to visit him just a month ago. Thank you so much for being here again today, Nicholas. And next is my good buddy, Nat Ford. Nat is the uh, CEO of Jacksonville Transit in Jacksonville, Florida. He's also the past immediate past chair of the American Public Transportation Association and really took the lead last year in helping lead our whole country's transit systems into focusing on the new mobility. So we're going to ask him about that today some. And next is Alan Feta, who is Deputy CEO of PTV, Public Transport Victoria. I was able to visit them last month as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. And then our friend Ian Dobbs, who is uh, head of UITP in Australia and the Deputy Chair of UITP Worldwide. Let's give him a round of applause. For those of you who may not know, Transit Unplugged is a podcast that right now is the world's leading podcast where we interview transit CEOs. Over the last 18 months, I've been able to travel the world and interview over 50 global CEOs of transit systems and finding out about their lives, their careers, their agencies, what they're working on, their big projects. It's really a -a one-of-a-kind show. If you haven't listened to it, it's free and it's at transitunplugged.com. Make sure you go there and subscribe to our podcast. Every two weeks, we have a new podcast come out. And right now, we're in a special series of Australia. So three of our guests today are from Australia. And we're doing one show a week uh, over the next five weeks on our Australia series. And then right after that, we'll go a couple in North America. And then in late summer, we'll have five or six shows from the United Kingdom, a recent trip I made there as well. So now we're going to go to our guests. What I'm going to first do is ask each of them to kind of give you a little bit about their background, what they oversee, and a little bit about what their current responsibilities are. So let's start with Nicholas. Nicholas uh, is a humble guy, but I got to tell you, he's got quite an operation. It's the world's largest light rail tram system in the whole world in Melbourne, Australia. Nicholas, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. So I'm Nicholas Jint. I'm actually 51. I've been working for public transport, heavy rail for 20 eight years now, mainly in uh, heavy rail for SNCF, which is the French uh, railway uh, company, and moved to uh, Australia three years ago, three and a years and a half, to uh, not only uh, renegotiate a contract with those people who were kind enough to, uh, to award us an extension of the contract for the next seven years, and now to uh, uh, operate uh, the, this beautiful tram network. It's a an iconic tram network in uh, in Melbourne. Everybody loves uh, trams, which is uh, which is really fantastic to operate, and uh, really proud to be leading this 2,300 uh, staff organization in Melbourne. Excellent, thank you. So, Nat Ford, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. And Nat just won a big award from the Eno Group, and tell us about that a little bit as well. 
Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, last week I had the opportunity and the honor of receiving the Eno Thought Leader Award for uh, the United States, and it's a great honor, and it was reflective of the work that I think you mentioned earlier, Paul, which was to really look at our industry in terms of uh, bus and rail and what we do in terms of public transport in the United States. It's clearly a new environment uh, with new technologies and new service delivery methods, and last year when I was the chief chair of uh, APTA, I pushed an agenda to focus on a new mobility paradigm where we broke away from our conventional transportation modes and looked at embracing not only biking, but biking, pedestrian access, as well as the TNCs and Uber and Lyft, because uh, I think at least my vision or my philosophy is that as public transport agencies, we are best prepared to be the holistic mobility integrators. Quite often, as I look at my work that I do now in Jacksonville, we're actually a road building and bridge building organization that has public transport transport as part of our responsibility. In that responsibility, I find myself quite often building the sidewalks to provide access or good access to public transport or building road networks that allow for easy access of automobiles, safe access for bicyclists, as well as expediting public transport in the same corridor. And so uh, it's a true belief that I have that uh, we should not just stop at bus, we should not stop at rail, but as an industry, we should look at the entire spectrum of transportation for our communities and knit those uh, solutions together. A lot of that experience came from my background as serving as the CEO of the San Francisco MTA where I had responsibility for all of those modes including taxi re regulations and things of that nature under one umbrella. And so uh, with that and serving in Atlanta, Metro Atlanta with the Atlanta uh, MARTA system there and uh, my origins of my career in transit started with New York City Transit. So I've worked all around our country in uh, the United States, and uh, I think after nearly three decades, I finally have figured out the solution, which is we should be running it all. So There you go. Very good. Nat's also got an amazing wife. Tell us a little about your wife for a second. Yes. Uh, so my better half, or I am very fortunate, my better half is uh, Janet Walker Ford, and she's around the corner, I think, here at the Cubic booth. Uh, she actually is uh, the head of their government relations program for uh, Cubic in the uh, United States. So uh, we, uh, we live and breathe it. It's part of our DNA. And then also my father was uh, in uh, New York City Transit as the senior VP of subway operations. So, and your sister is? And my sister is in Maryland, and she is the di uh, chief, deputy chief operating officer for rail in Baltimore and Maryland. So. Yeah, for my old subway system. She's doing a great job. Yeah. I keep tabs on her. After I left, she got the position, yes, and uh, they say she's doing a wonderful job. So his whole family, which is what I was trying to tell you, he's, mm -hmm. uh, he's got an ecosystem of uh, public right. transit around him. It comes from a great family. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Paul. Very good. Alan, now, now uh, a little bit about the structure there. PTV, Public Transport Victoria, uh, oversees all the transit in the state of Victoria, which includes the city of Melbourne, and they actually are the funding agency that helps fund Nicholas's light rail system. So go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, if we keep the family link going, actually, I might start by telling you a little bit more about my father, um, who was actually an oiler and fueler at um, a Sydney bus depot for the, most of his career. And I remember as a young child, probably about 10 years of age, going with him and just watching the buses coming in and out of the depot. Um, and it never occurred to me that I would end up working in public transport. Uh, my um, career background is actually in um, customer relations, working for telecommunications companies and um, energy retailers and it wasn't until this fine gentleman Ian Dobbs about seven years ago started talking to me about public transport and saying we really need to change the way we think about those people on our network and actually realizing that they are passengers and they are customers and we need to start having a real customer focus and whilst the engineering is really critical for reliability and safety uh, at the heart of what we do is actually those passengers that are buying those tickets getting on board our buses, using the technology. Um, so that's my background. I've been um, with PTV now for seven years. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive and oversee all of the contracts with organisations like Keolis, um, MTM, Transdev and a number of um, world leading operators. And whilst it's key for us to get good commercial outcomes for the state, the priority is putting the customer at the heart of everything that we do and everything that our operators do. 
And Jerome Weimar is your uh, CEO, is that right? That is right, a Dutchman, uh, Jerome Weimer, <laughs> who couldn't be here today, um, but importantly, he's been part of the podcast series already. Yes. So, Nicholas is our guest this week on the podcast. So, if you go to transitunplugged.com, he'll, you'll hear all about his background and experience. And I rode the light rail system there quite a bit uh, while I was there in Melbourne and found it uh, wonderful. The downtown central business district is free. You can ride for free. And uh, it's, a, it's massively packed. Uh, they do not have the problem of a lack of ridership there. We'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ian, and about UITP in general and what you all do. I think I'll just start by kind of carrying on the theme of uh, the people theme. One of the great things about this summit is that it brings a lot of really good people together from around the world. So the networks that we build up through these kind of events are amazing. Uh, Alan's right. I mean, you know, we, I had the misfortune of <laughs> recruiting him to the, uh, the, the transit industry uh, seven years ago, and I'm only joking. He's become my style guru, um, and it's great to see, actually, you know, taking on the reins of managing the franchisees. And I, look, I look over to Nicholas, of course, and had a, a relationship while I was running uh, PTV in Melbourne with your organization and yourself, uh, which was great fun. Now, Melbourne's our trans- are iconic. And that's what this is all about, coming together with friends and colleagues, sharing experiences, common challenges, uh, and that's what UITP is about. It's about bringing together the best people in the world in this industry, learning from one another and sharing best practice. Um, we, We obviously advocate for transport as well, and we do a lot of other things, but it's about people, and that's why I love it. Um, I've been in this industry for 43 years. Ouch. Started um, at age 10. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I really am a railwayman, actually, by background. I was a railway operator in the UK for 16 years. I came over to Melbourne to run the public transport system when it was publicly owned and publicly run. I ran the trams, amongst uh, other things like the buses and the rail system. We then franchised it, and uh, I went away for a few years. Um, I ran private rail franchises in the UK uh, for a private operator there, and then came back to set up Public Transport Victoria. So I now do a little bit of board work here and there, uh, try to keep occupied, grow grapes as well, down on the Mornington Peninsula. Make wine with them? I have a friend who makes the wine. Uh, Mr. Fedder is one of my... Drinks the wine. is one of my... (laughs) That's an important role. (laughs) Um, And I mean, I've been blessed that in 43 years I've had a a great and varied career in Australia, the UK, and now actually touching base with people around the world with UITP. It's such a great industry and they're such great people. So that's me in a nutshell. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Let's give our group a round of applause. Wasn't that it? Great, great guys here leading our industry. If you just walked up, we, this is the first ever Global CEO Roundtable sponsored by Transit Unplugged, uh, the world's top podcast, which is focused on interviewing public transit CEOs. And now I want to go to Nat and ask Nat a question. Nat, tell us a little bit more about what technology you're using. I know you're, one of the things that's interesting in the differences between what's happening around the world. When I was in the UK a couple weeks ago, there's not a lot of focus on autonomous vehicles. In the United States, Every major transit system is piloting or thinking about piloting autonomous vehicles. Over in the United Kingdom, they're not so focused on mobility as a service. In the United States, it's a lot of focus on that. So tell us some about the new technologies that are affecting North American transit. Uh, So, I I think uh, last year when we started down this path of looking at this new mobility paradigm, it became very clear that one of the biggest challenges, obviously, and I think that affects all of our systems, is the last mile, first mile challenge. And I think the partnering with uh, TNCs and and contracting some of those services to be on demand is really an opportunity for our community to expand on public transportation and make our existing systems that much more robust. And so uh, in the United States, there's a number 
number of systems around the country that have partnerships ranging from private operators that are operating small shuttles, things of that nature, and connecting that last and first mile, and going as far as partnering with Uber and Lyft and subsidizing trips to do uh, to connect with their uh, main transportation hubs. In Jacksonville, we actually launched something called Ready Ride, which is a contracted service. It's an on-demand service, and it allowed us to eliminate some of our lower productive fixed route services, reallocate those services to more of our heavily traveled routes and, and corridors, and then subsidize those trips at a much lower cost and price point, and it's more on-demand, uh, responsive type of services. As it relates to autonomous vehicles, we were fortunate uh, in uh, December of this uh, past year, we received a grant from the US DOT to implement phase one of what we call the U2C project, the ultimate urban circulator project. We have in our downtown a two and a half mile uh, automated people mover that is well beyond its useful life. Uh, we're keeping it up and running, but it was built over 30 years ago. And with our road building acumen uh, and then recognizing the new technologies that are being developed in terms of autonomous vehicles, we came up with a concept or developed a concept to convert that monorail to an actual roadway and then to build a series of end of line ramps, uh, much the same as the highway ramps that we build, a ramp that, uh, system that will allow us to uh, replace the existing monorail with autonomous vehicles and then expand the two and a half mile footprint to a 10 mile system using autonomous vehicles. The grant we received is for phase one, which is connecting with the Jacksonville Jaguars football team stadium, uh, connecting our downtown core to uh, uh, that facility, and then subsequent phases will convert the aerial structure, which we, we see as a major benefit having that two and a half mile aerial structure. Uh, but again, it was locked in that two and a half miles for almost 30 years and really did not have good origins and destinations. And now we're finally, I think, taking advantage of the vision of our fathers uh, in Jacksonville from some time ago. So with that, uh, autonomous vehicle technology is underway in Jacksonville, uh, Las Vegas, Canton, Ohio. I think they also received a grant from USDOT. And the strategy, I think, from a national perspective is to focus on autonomous tra uh, technology because of its flexibility and its low cost versus some light rail infrastructure investments, the feeling is that the technology may be so robust in another 10 to 20 years that we would be looking at alternatives and flexibility. So we're very excited about the program. Very good. Thank you very much. I also want to recognize somebody in the crowd who's going to be a guest tomorrow, and that's Brad Thomas here. He's president of First Transit. Thank you so much for being here today, Brad. He's doing a little discovery, see what it's going to be like for tomorrow, but he's going to be a great guest on tomorrow's show. Nicholas, in Melbourne, where you run the Yara Tram system, tell us about the system itself, kind of the ridership, and what some of the new challenges are you're facing. What are you going to be doing the next year or two? Yes, it's it's uh, it's quite a big uh, network, as we said, probably the longest in the in the world, 250 kilometers of tracks, and in terms of the ridership, we move 210 million uh, people a, a year, which uh, comp compares quite well with the with the trains network in Melbourne, who move uh, uh, 240 million uh, people a, a year. So, 210 million a year. Exactly, 210. On, on just one mode. Yes, that one like, mode. Yeah. And it's uh, in Melbourne, you will find uh, metropolitan trains, you will find trams, there is no subway. So it's definitely a, a, a mission that we, uh, as a tram operator, have taken over. And like uh, big cities that have a subway, we have trams. So quite a big system. It's a legacy system, let's be clear. It has been created in uh, 1906, a long, long time ago. And that's fantastic because that enables you to become iconic so that's the positive side of it the less positive side of it is that the infrastructure is not brand new is that uh, some of our trams are 40 plus year old and of course that creates some very exciting challenges and that creates a lot of the enthusiasm in terms of uh, finding the way to uh, to maintain appropriately this uh, this uh, trams uh, this uh, infrastructure make sure that we deliver the best uh, service for for the community that relies a lot on on our service and one of the things you were telling me while you were there was that you're working on making it more accessible for people with disabilities. Is that right? 
Yes, of course. Legacy system, of course, means that we, we have to work. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, uh, uh, an everyday uh, discussion we have with, uh, with the government and with PTV to find a way to uh, improve the accessibility in the system. Uh, we have 1,700 stops in all in the city. 1,700, that's one stop every 200 meters, which is quite a, a lot of stops. 400 of them are already accessible raised platforms so we have a th further 1300 stops to uh, to upgrade in the in the future and we we, we definitely discuss that uh, with the PTV to 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 have a plan for the future to uh, to bring this accessibility not only with the stops but also with the uh, new trams uh, low floor trams that will help to have a fully accessible service uh, that we all want uh, to have very good ian are you there <laughs> i just like to Put a plug in here actually 2021 is the next summit in melbourne australia i know we're a long way away i know it's not easy to travel over those kind of distances but you have to come and see the world's largest tram system it is iconic it's so much part of melbourne and its culture that it's not true it's part of the streetscape and you know nicholas and his team run this amazing system and in the center of melbourne and in the inner suburbs it is the subway as you rightly say it carries a lot of people and it would be worth if for nothing else just to come and see it in two years time so i'm sorry about the plug paul but no i was going to ask you about it so i'm glad you you uh prefaced it there i love the city of melbourne by the way if you are you know just to go to a city melbourne to me has the feel of chicago in america it's it's a uh, it's a working city it's it doesn't feel like a federal city, like to me, um, you know, some other cities feel like, like a New York City or whatever. It felt more, I don't know, I could be more in touch with it. Uh, I loved it. Great art there, a wonderful city. I can't wait to see you there again soon. Um, so why don't you just continue a little bit more and talk to us about what is UITP doing in Australia right now? Quite simply, what we're doing is bringing people together. You know, we are, uh, although we're a, a single nation, in both Australia and, and obviously there's New Zealand as well. Nevertheless, we are really a collection of states and public transport in Australia and uh, particularly is, uh, is state-based. So in the past it's been, the, the degree of collaboration has been limited. So what we're trying to do is to bring people together from different states, from different cities, suppliers, transport authorities, operators, to really work and collaborate together. And, it, and it's that power of the people, as it were, that network that we've worked very hard to improve. And I think, looking at our members here, we are succeeding. We get people together on a regular basis, whether it's congresses, whether it's training events, uh, boardroom lunches. We share best practice. We never used to do that. And you work with that group, Australia, Australia Asia Railway Association. Is that part of you, or is that a? Because I spoke to some people from there while I was there. It's the asset manager. The Australasian Railway Association is a separate organisation um, and is more technical based okay, yeah. on just on railways. We are multimodal. We're more about the system than a single mode, and we're more about policy and uh, the future, if you like, future of mobility. Coming back to that, and I'm going to ask you about that. And my next question: What you so think about that? What is happening in the future around the world? Let me ask you, Alan. What's coming in the near future for PTV? What are the new uh, advances you all are doing there in the, in the state? Well, as Nicola mentioned about patronage on the tram network, our multimodal network has over 605 million trips every single year. And the population growth in Melbourne is increasing so rapidly that by 2026 we will exceed Sydney's population. So we will be the largest city in Melbourne, in Australia. And so for, to be able to cope with the increased patronage, the next 12 months, in fact the next um, five, six years, is all about building capacity in the network. And it's about managing disruption on the network network as we transform uh, the infrastructure on top of a live network. We are building a nine kilometre twin tunnel to completely replicate our city loop with a new metro tunnel, five new stations, and it's going to significantly increase the capacity on our network. We're removing 75 level crossings across the rail network as well, um, and replacing train stations, brand new stations, but also making it safer for pedestrians, road users, and making the train network more reliable. As we roll out these projects, 
context, we are disrupting passengers' normal journeys every single day. And in fact, disruption's becoming a normal part of our transport network. So we're all about moving people, but now we're also about finding alternative ways of moving people. Um, in July, we're going to have another massive disruption as we continue work on our high-capacity metro trains, our new high-capacity signalling, continuing the tunnelling works. And when we do that, we have to put on 600 replacement buses to keep people moving. And that's a real challenge, keeping people getting to their work, getting to school, getting to health, but at the same time, understanding that we're um, making their journeys a little bit longer. When I was there a month ago, your Prime Minister was coming into town to announce a new uh, rail line out to the airport or something like that, and there was a lot of talk about $50 billion, Australian dollars, of investment in new rail. I mean, it seems like your national government has made a decision that investment in infrastructure is key to the success of their, the cities, right? Look, I think it's fantastic across all of Australia. We're, I call it a renaissance. We're seeing significant investments, whether it's light rail in Canberra, light rail in Sydney. Sydney, you go to Queensland, there are major projects all over the country. And I think it's important, both at a state level and a federal level, that you have commitment to these major infrastructure programs, because we're not just planning for the next 12 months, we're planning for the next 30 years, the next 50 years, and you've got to have that long-term long -term vision, and importantly, the um, financial backing from a federal and a state government level. That's good. Nat, why don't you talk about that in the U.S.? What's happening with funding? Where are we going? What's happening in America with transit? Exactly. So, as you're aware, our current uh, bill for funding public transport is going to be expiring in about 18 months. And so, we're hard at work at APTA developing a platform that we will be taking to our federal legislators, to USDOT, and to Congress to renew that investment in public transportation, but also to look at that investment in a way that allows for flexibility, because it's going to be a bill that we have to live with for the next five to six years. And so, with technology changing the, at the rapid pace that it's changing, you know, where does autonomous vehicles fit in? Where does TNCs and shared ride services fit in? When historically, our funding model has been fixed guideway or bus and bus uh, infrastructure. And so we're looking at, one, strengthening the funding, expanding the funding for what we currently historically have been funded for, but also looking at additional funding that allows for uh, implementing these alternatives alternative services, and also goes as far as looking at how we capture data. Right now, in terms of ridership, data that's on a bus or a ridership that's on a bus or a rail, we count that. It counts towards your funding in terms of formula funding, things of that nature. Services that I sponsor, for example, uh, and do not provide directly, even through a contractor, do not provide indirectly, they are not allowed to be counted in, in terms of my ridership number. So, we're looking at really a total transformation, not so much we need the funding, but the buckets or the description or the categories of that funding is more critical now than ever so that over the next few years as technology develops, we're not locked out of funding to allow us to do projects like the U2C project and some of these other projects uh, that some of my colleagues in the U.S. are doing. So uh, it's an exciting time, but it's, you know, we are competing against a host of needs at the federal level. I think more than ever, just make advocacy with uh, UITP, with uh, APTA, and all of the different organizations, advocacy nationally and I think globally is so critical around public transportation and the growth that we're seeing in our communities that are exponential and people moving back into, particularly in the United States, moving back into downtown, developing downtown central cities, it's going to be critical in the future. Thank you. Nicholas, I want to ask you about a little bit about the model that happens in Australia. I've been traveling the world over the last uh, few months, and different countries run transit differently when it comes to private companies. So you work for a company called Keolis. I think you partner with a local partner, the downer part of Keolis Downer. Tell us about the model of how they're running transit in Australia with private companies running some of it, and a little bit about your company. So the, the model in, in, in Australia is slightly different from what we, we can see in, in, in other countries, especially in regards to the, to the fare box. We have a, a model that in Australia, to, to promote the idea of um, you know, operators cooperating and not uh, competing uh, with each other, the idea is to have a, a common fare box that is actually allocated to a, a fixed rate 
to the different operators. So for us, to take an example, we are Yara Trams, we get 20% of the metropolitan fare box, which means that it is the fare box that comes from trams services, but also the fare box that comes from uh, train services. That's interesting because that means that that gives you an incentive to actually cooperate with the trains and not compete with trains because uh -huh. altogether we have a strong incentive. Trains have 40% of this fare box. We have 20% of it. Whatever the driver of this fare box increase is coming from us. So you all get to us. keep that. Of course. Okay. Of course. All right. That's very different to, uh, to other models that we can see in, uh, in Europe where actually the mode gets... It's fair box. It's of course complemented by the the, the, the the subsidy that we get from the from the government. But this is your fair box. It's not the case in in Australia, and I find it very very smart. That is interesting. Yeah. Tell us a little about Keolis itself. We'll give you one minute to do a little commercial on Keolis oh. if you like, since you guessed to be here. I'm very impressed with the company Keolis personally. I was at one of your big summits when I was CEO of MTA. Uh, I was able to meet some people in France, and I was very impressed with what you all do. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting company, of course. it's a, We operate in 16 countries across the world. We have a, our two strong uh, places, are France and uh, United Kingdom. But, of course, Australia, North America, new countries coming uh, like uh, 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 India or China and a lot of uh, projects for the future including in, uh, in, uh, in Africa in countries where public transport will become very important in the future so we are global we are really in an approach to uh, promote the partnership with the governments it's uh, it's really interesting to work on this kind of a uh, partnership approach I think that makes a difference with uh, other companies we really strive to uh, to uh, to make uh, 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 yes a, a good partnership with our clients that are the public transport authorities. Are you investors in Navia? So we are a shareholder of Navia, vehicles, yes, yeah. of course. And actually, we did a, a few trials in, uh, in Australia in, uh, with Latrobe University in Melbourne, but also in Newcastle soon to, um, yes, to try a service of uh, autonomous electric that was very interesting. I think that uh, says a lot for the future. I have a talk I do called Five Hidden Flaws of Most Transit Systems, and one of them is a lack of individual accountability. And I feel like most transit systems don't hold the individual employees accountable for their on-time performance. We normally hold them accountable for maybe safety, maybe attendance, but what about actually running the service? And one of the things I'm impressed with that your company does is have visualization rooms where all the key performance indicators are up on the wall. And every day, you bring your managers in there and make them look at those numbers and defend those numbers. We know that governments often run by story, by anecdote. And public officials, I was a former elected official, we're normally uh, swayed by the latest comment we hear from someone coming in and saying, you know, oh, well, my bus was late. Yeah, well, you know what? That was an anomaly. We're running 96% on time. I can show you right here on this app, and we could see that we're 96% on time. So I'll have my you know, assistant get the details from you. We'll find out what happened and give you a free ride. But making sure that individuals are held accountable is a key part of making transit systems more effective. And making them more effective is a key part of getting people to ride. And that's a problem across America and England. It's a lower ridership. Uh, Brad and I were just talking about this beforehand. Transit systems are seeing a lack of ridership across the world. Some cities are seeing an increase. Ian, tell us why. <laughs> Tell us what's happening with ridership in Australia, at least. Australia has seen a, a boom, actually, in the last, I guess, eight to ten years. Um, uh, when I started in this industry, it was on the way down. It really was. Um, people used to say, why do you want to work in transit? It's a dying industry. And, and I guess to some degree, yes, it was. It's changed completely now. And I think, you know, as cities have got bigger, don't forget Melbourne, you know, is nearly 5 million people. It's a very large city. Wow. And the congestion we're getting is making public transport massively more attractive to users. Also, we've got better at running the systems, yeah, to be honest. I was going to comment on that. I mean, your, your systems are amazingly well run. And, and that's around the world, that's the case as well. It's not just us. Um, and on top of that, we've got significant population growth. So we're, we're booming off the back of that. And a lot of the people who are arriving in our country are public transport 
advocates anyway. They've come from places that public transport is the norm. So we've really enjoyed a growth. And it's been, at times it's been a challenge because it's been so rapid, it's difficult to keep up. Yes. Tell us a little bit. One of the things I was really impressed with was in Sydney, Sydney Rails, Howard Collins, great guy, the CEO there. But he took us to the Rail Operations Center, the new Rock. Uh, have you been there? Have you been able to see that? And if so, tell us a little about it. No, I haven't actually. I'm, I'm, I've, I've had a, a promise of a visit. Um, I've known Howard 20 years. He's a former uh, compatriot, of your expatriate, right? Uh, like a number of people uh, in Australia, I sat on the Transport Police Authority Committee with him in England. And I've known, I've known Howard. He's a very good operator. And I think Sydney's a good example of where they've taken a legacy railway, worked very hard, particularly on the customer service side, and significantly improved the public's perception of the product. So on top of that, of course, they've attracted people to it. The Rock, I think, is one of those technical upgrades that Sydney's going through at the moment, along with high capacity signalling as well, which they're bringing in, um, which is a, you know, it's a very risky, it's a very high profile technological upgrade for, for the hardware, but um, it will reap massive benefits. And we're seeing that with the performance in Sydney. It's increased massively. Uh, and at that point, I should also plug, of course, Sydney has got Australia's first fully autonomous. I was going to say light rail. It's not light rail. It's, it's a heavy rail. And that's really, uh, that happened in the last few weeks. It's just been launched. It's um, a massive watershed for us. And I think when people in Australia actually see it and ride on it, there's going to be demand in other places for similar infrastructure. John Holland helped build that, right? Right. Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And, and in fact, um, uh, MTR from Hong Kong, right. uh, which is MTA in Australia, are running it on behalf of the government. So, um, exciting times in Sydney. Yes. Video work just looked amazing when I saw the videos of it. And Howard told us about it when we were there. Thank you. Well, let's talk about uh, Public Transport Victoria. What, what are you looking to in the next five to ten years in the sense of technology? And what's going to help take you to the next level to meet the needs of a growing city? Like Ian said, and it's funny you mentioned that about really demographics driving ridership. When I was talking to the CEO of King County Transit, he's a friend of mine, he said Seattle was one of the few cities in America that's seen increases in ridership in 2017 and in 2018. And he told me a lot of it is just demographically driven. Our city is growing with young people who see transit as, you know, something for everyone to ride, not just some people to ride. But that is happening in cities that are growing, like, like Melbourne. What do you see as a future of technology to help you meet those needs? I think as we continue to try and put on more services to move more people, we have to find the technology that's going to help us do that quickly and safely. Uh, a number of jurisdictions around the world have already introduced high capacity signalling and for us that's a really important focus and we're putting high capacity signalling in a brownfields environment and that in itself is a massive challenge um, and we've been working on that project over the last few years and hope to have it live uh, by the end of the year. So it's not just about high capacity signalling, we often forget about some of the simple technologies technologies that our passengers feel and experience every single day in their hands. Only eight weeks ago we launched um, our smart car ticketing system through Google Pay, which allows people now to replicate the, the smart card and all of the fare rules now are available through a, an app and, and we'll be, um, we, we've already sold 100,000 um, tickets in the last um, eight weeks alone using that. We're also working with Trapeze at the moment on upgrading our real-time information for bus networks. So I think whilst we think about the mass multi-million dollar projects around um, hard rail and infrastructure. We shouldn't forget the technology um, that makes a real difference to passengers. Um, and I think we also need to look at how we integrate into the technologies that already exist. So the Google Pay work that we did with NTT Data, who's our ticketing operator, is really interesting because Google Pay um, is already in the hands of so many passengers out there. So why build something new when you can already get into somebody his hand um, when they've got the technology already on them. Yeah, that's something that TFL was talking to me about. Um, uh, this, um, Simon Reed, I think his name was, from TFL. I was 
in his office three weeks ago, and instead of Mobility as a Service, which is a separate app that a transit agency puts together where they're their mobility aggregator, he was suggesting instead of that, let's make our transit kind of accessible to everyone on the apps they're already using, such as if you're going to go to a movie and you're on their app and you're picking a movie ticket, then the next thing that pops up underneath that is the bus routes, and you can figure out how you're going to get there. Are you all, what is your thoughts on that with technology? Is there room for both approaches? do you think? I do think there's room for both because uh, you can't um, meet all the requirements through one app and sometimes the um, state government authorities need to ensure that everybody is able to um, get the information they need. But we've been working across the state um, by making our data available and open access to data will um, allow for that market to come in and fill the gap. Um, we know our um, Roads Association, RACV, are working on their own mobility as a service app uh, and they'll use the data that we provide. So I think if you ensure that the data is seen as owned by the public rather than being owned by the transit authority or the roads authority, what you'll find is that um, the apps which are already out there can continue to develop and provide alternative solutions for, for passengers. That's great. So we're at the, uh, for those of you who just joined us, this is a global CEO roundtable. We have four CEOs, three from Australia, one from North America. I've got one more question for you all, and that is, if you could give us what you think would be one new innovation that could help public transit and why it would help it, that would kind of focus us on the future. One cool new innovation that will really help public transit and why. Nicholas, could you start us off? If I had one, uh, I will take one which is probably a little bit behind the stage. We talked a lot about innovation to improve the, the passenger experience. Let's be very aware that there will be fantastic things happening in running stock and asset maintenance. We can build and develop predictive maintenance based on data that we will collect remotely from, uh, from uh, either trams or trains or from the infrastructure just to anticipate the need of the maintenance. That will be a game changer. It is critical because I think assets are probably one of the most important things in our, in our, in our industry and, and because assets are owned by the governments but maintained by uh, operators sometimes it's a little bit of a of both decision makers so we have to make sure that it's not forgotten and this is key for us in the future to improve the way we will uh, make those assets uh, safe reliable and and fit for purpose that's excellent a uh, little inside baseball but you know iso 55000 those standards which require us to maintain and the predictive analysis that products um, like Trapeze is, to be honest, with the EAM software, just does an amazing job, and some others do I know as well, but it's taking, so here's a good example. So I used to run MTA in Baltimore, and uh, we would have a bus breakdown every day, right? We had 750 buses running, and the bus would break down somewhere on route. Think about the ripple effect of that bus breaking down. The passengers that are on board that vehicle have to then transfer, transfer to another vehicle once it gets there. We have to call to the garage and get it to come out. Then somebody has to come with a big tow truck and tow that vehicle back, and then this new vehicle, you had to get a new driver out to it. There's so much things that happen. If you could predict it, like Nicholas says, and say, hey, if the temperature on this vehicle gets to X, it's going to break down within five minutes. Then you know to get that vehicle over. It triggers another vehicle going out there. That The, the cost savings alone on that are phenomenal. The man hours saved, uh, or women hours saved, on, on all the work required to make that happen. So he is right. It's a little inside baseball, but that's a great technology. Making sure the predictive analysis is in place at every transit system in the world would make a major difference. Thank you. How about you, Nat? Give us one big new innovation. One big new innovation. Very difficult question because I think we're still working on some of the innovations that are in front of us right now. But I think, uh, you know, we are developing a culture or a community that is really looking at immediate fulfillment of whatever we want. And I think if we're able to come close to that immediate fulfillment of when someone wants to take a trip, that a vehicle is available for them in a reasonable amount of time, predictable with the consistency and quality of service, vehicle type and experience, and to deliver them 
with the predictability that they're expecting in the future. I think that's going to be a major milestone. And then to really kind of shoot this into the sky in terms of innovation, uh, I just think uh, you know our communities really are going to see how we embrace uh, transportation from a vertical standpoint. Uh, you know, some of the new technologies related to vertical lift and being able to transport small groups of individuals using the airspace is going to be something that we need to think about and see how that is going to impact our communities, either in a negative way, which will allow more sprawl, or in a positive way, which is those short trips that uh, will free up uh, some of our capacity in terms of uh, roadway space. That's excellent. I think he's right. Do you agree with that? You know, the world has become Uberized now, right? That everybody wants to be able to look, see the vehicle coming. I want it to come as quickly as possible. Again, Simon Reed, I was asking him innovations. And he said stuff I'd never heard before from TFL as your technology director. He said the same thing. If we can have bus service come out to the stop when there's at least four people there and they know that, you know, kind of a group pickup, if we can have micro transit kind of filling in the gaps and getting people immediate where they don't have to stand at a bus stop for 30 minutes waiting for a bus. That's the second key, by the way. You know, there's three keys to increase ridership, I think. And, you know, one of them is making sure your routes are taking people where they want to go today. Two is increased frequency of your heaviest routes. And the third is reduction of friction. So that would mean bus-only lanes, transit signal priority, payment of your fares off bus, or quicker tap-and-go options when you get on. Those are the three keys that are happening on all eight cities in America that saw increased ridership last year. When I was in England, it was the United Kingdom. I was uh, corrected when I was there. <laughs> when I was in the United Kingdom, that's what they're doing there as well. The cities that are seeing increases, Giles Fernley from First Transit told me, that cities like Bristol are seeing a 40% increase in ridership last year. And it's because they did exactly that. They did changing of the routes to take people where they want to go. They're adding frequency to their bus routes, and they're reducing the friction. That's making the system run more efficiently. Where maybe in a central business district, you could actually get somewhere faster on a bus than you could walking, which isn't always the case in some cities now. So let's talk about uh, at PTV. What do you see as one new big technology or innovation that can help improve transit and why? I think we've got to talk about power because as we build the infrastructure to put on new services, the demand that has on electricity is huge. Certainly our rail network is um, the second largest user of electricity in Victoria. Um, so whilst we talk about carbon emissions and reducing the carbon emissions, we need to keep looking at innovations to reduce the consumption of power. Walking around here today, you can see some of the work happening around hydrogen solutions, but um, I think we've got a lot more work to do in reducing the impact on the environment, but also reducing the overall cost um, to run the public transport network. Excellent. Thank you. And Ian, give us your perspective. That's a great point, actually. It's a great point. And it's one of our nation's biggest challenges. We've got a real problem with energy. I'm going to be really boring, but kind of go back to what Nicholas, because he's an operator like me. He's a, he's a French railway operator. I'm an English, I can say English operator, British operator. When I was in the younger in my younger days, uh, at the beginning of my career, I learned very quickly that cutting to the chase, people want reliable services. And if you can't deliver what you promise to the customer, it doesn't matter how good the rest of the technology is, you're on a loser. So, you know, I don't think there is a single answer to this, and I'm sorry, that's kind of squirming away out of the question. Yes, it is, actually. Um, there are, I mean, there's a number of things which will help or should help develop more reliable services. We must be careful we don't take our focus off, you know, what is our knitting, which is delivering actually what we promise to the customer. That's number one. It drives perceptions of everything else. Our surveys in those early days showed that there's a direct correlation between the punctuality of services and customer satisfaction in all kinds of areas. So once you get that right, then you can do the other bits and bobs. And, and I think therefore any technological innovations that can be targeted at what is the boring operating and engineering stuff actually has the biggest benefit. Excellent. That's a great way to wrap it up. Focusing on really what our end 
our end purpose is. And I think what we've heard from all of our CEOs today is that everything they're doing is driven from a passion to help people. I know that's what's driving us and me personally and our company is an effort to really help the hundreds of millions of people who ride public transport every day. And the mobility that they need in order to make their lives really meaningful, we help provide that. I can't think of a better business to be in, and I can't think of four greater leaders to be on our panel today than these four gentlemen. Let's give them a round of applause. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.